Amen. You may be seated. All right, let me start off tonight with a question. What are some of your favorite superheroes? This is an easy question. I feel like I've asked it before. Come on, shut them out. Melinda. Jesus. Jesus. All right, she got the easy one, so it's up to you all now. What do you got? Captain Marvel, okay. Superman. Superman. There's the classic. I kind of expected it with that shirt. Yes, sir. Arrow? Arrow? Oh, man, an Arrow fan. All right. Toby Maguire's Specifically Toby Maguire's Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, sir. Iron Man and who? Captain America. Man, after my heart there. All right, anyone else? Other superheroes? You've already gone. What? Groot. Groot. I'll let you have it on. Flash, Groot, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. Oh, Matthew. <laughs> Any others? Any last heroes? Batman. Batman. All right, now that I've had the two biggies, we can, we can move on. Uh, <laughs> you had your chance, Jairus. <laughs> All right, well, those, those are some classic heroes. Oftentimes with those superheroes, they have what's called an origin story, okay? Hopefully you all know what an origin story is. It's simply the story that tells the beginnings of those heroes and how they became heroes. In fact, oftentimes many of those superheroes you mentioned appeared, especially some of the older ones like Superman and Batman, they appear and their origin stories are really defined later. People are like, oh, we like Superman. We'll read more. And they're like, oh, man, we'll come up with a reason he exists, right? And they start writing more. And so we often see these origin stories after the fact that we see them become a hero, we, we, we see them become this hero, we, we understand it only after, only later. And it's become quite popular. Many of the movies choose to make it off of the origin story, right? So many of our favorite superhero movies do this. It, it isn't always what starts the hero, but I will say one of my favorite heroes is getting an origin story next summer. Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Buzz Lightyear. I'm excited about it. Yes, I agree. A true superhero, and we'll, we'll get his story uh, next summer. So one of the superheroes of the Bible, you can't read Scripture without hearing about him, is the Apostle Paul, okay? And so tonight we're going to look at his origin story. In fact, he writes most of the New Testament, and a lot of that gets written before we even hear, like, his origin story. And so faithful Luke uh, writes it down in the book of Acts, and he gets three different instances of Paul's origin story because Paul recounts it later to other people. We're going to look at just the first one tonight, and I'm going to tell you right off, he's originally called Saul. So tonight, you will hear me say Saul and Paul interchangeably. I'm never going to know which one I'm going to say, but I'm talking about the same person, okay? Nod your heads. Saul and Paul, same guy in this instance, okay? Saul and Paul. So to tell you a little bit about Saul before we, we, we read the passage he is what, what I would call a Hellenistic Jew, okay? So he's a Jewish person. He's an Israelite, right? And he's, he's like, got it all. He, he talks about this in, in Romans at one point. I am, the, like, the most Israelite of all Israelites, okay? So he's, he's got all the right cards to be the correct kind of Jewish person, okay? It, it'd be like if, you're a, if you ever went to children's church, that was a thing a long time ago. We had a, I don't know if you remember her, Mrs. Lisa, Cindy. Oh, yeah. You remember that name? Okay, well, William remembers Mrs. Lisa. Well, she had this thing, right? It'd be like the, the five hole punches of showing up on Sunday. If I was on time, and if I had, like, brought my Bible, if I had, like, a verse memorized, and if I got all, like, five of these things, she'd give me, like, a little punch card thing, and then after, like, I don't know, ten of those, she'd, like, go buy me a book or a piece of candy or something, okay? So as a faithful Sunday school goer, right? I was always after all of those. This is like Saul here, okay? He's got all of those things checked off. Always, all the time. Never, never uh, absent. But he lived among the Romans, okay? So he, he knew these people who were not very Israelite, like many of you who are Christian, and yet you go to school with a bunch of non-Christians, okay? So you, you understand living with other people. You're not in this secluded bubble. And so he was... He's going to be key later, in fact, in the book of Acts, and we're not going to talk about any of this, but go read your Bibles and you will see all of this, okay? I like how I plug in options for you to read the Bible. It's a good thing, and your youth pastor will always probably tell you to do such things. But you can go read about how he talks a lot about the Gentiles, and, and God uses him specifically for the Gentiles because he knew them. He could think like them, and he cared about them. He had a heart for them. But before any of that... 
Saul, being the good Jewish person he is, hates Jesus at this time, okay? Not, not, I don't want you to hear me wrong, not all Jewish people hated Jesus, okay? Some believed in Jesus, right? Peter, we talked about him last week. But if, in fact, when you talk about superheroes of the faith, there's two kind of, two big church leaders in the book of Acts. Peter, who we talked about last week, Paul, who we talked about tonight. But before we get there, Paul is a villain, an absolute villain. He is he, he uh, in fact, we're going to see this guy named Stephen. He gets killed, okay? One of the first Christian martyrs, one of the first Christians to be killed, which is a big deal because we're not really supposed to be killing people, okay? And they like, Jewish people like stoned him to death, okay? That's, according to their law, was okay. According to the Romans, eh, it's on the fishy side, okay? But it starts this big old persecution of Christians, big old persecutions of the church. And Saul becomes a key leader doing this, makes a big name for himself. If you're a Christian, you know his name, right? It's like in, in Star Wars. If you're a rebel, you know about Darth Vader. You know to avoid Darth Vader, okay? Saul is the Darth Vader to the early Christians. And it, it just clicked for many of you, I think. I'm seeing heads. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate you. So we're going to read this passage, and then we're going to ask this question, what happened to him? What is this, this origin story they were seeing? So join me in Acts chapter 9. It'll be on the screen for you. Let me just read the first 20 verses, okay? So, so buckle up. Here it goes. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, code for Christian at this time, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And so they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time, and immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, he is the Son of God. All right, 20 verses, fascinating, classic story, and we're going to ask this question, what happened to Saul? And the first thing I want to point out there is, we start off the passage with, Saul was still breathing threats and murder, okay? So he absolutely 100% hated Christians. You notice that he called it followers of the way. It's one of the earliest things we Christians were called were followers of the way because we followed a guy named Jesus who said he was the way. Yep, you're getting it, right? The way, the truth, the life. And, and so we followed Jesus. We were called Christians. He absolutely hated them, did not believe that, that Jesus possibly could have been the Messiah. And, and so he sought to arrest any and all Christians. And so we, we see... The Lord show up to him while he's on this road, on the way. He basically got this hit list. He's like, hey, I'm going to go find a bunch of Christians. I, I bet they're in Damascus. Can I have a list? L like, like a warrant, like something that says I can do this legally, sort of legally. <laughs> and they're like, sure. <laughs> so he goes and he does it, right? And he's on his way to find and hunt down Christians because he's already been doing so. And yet we see this, the, we see the Lord come out and say, Saul, Saul, which 
maybe for some of you, since we've gotten through this series pretty, pretty well now, we're almost to the end of our series on Called Out, and we look at the, the stories of God calling people, here we see like a classic calling formula. We saw this with, with Moses and with Samuel, where God shows up and he says, Moses, Moses, or Samuel, Samuel. He tends to start with this name and sometimes even says it more than once. So he says, Saul, Saul, this classic formula. And Saul answers in one of the weirdest ways possible. Who are you, Lord? Which is a paradoxical question. Who are you, Lord? I mean, you must be Lord, but who are you, Lord? It's weird. He's already calling him Lord, so he's got some understanding of what's happening. And yet he is, he's completely confused because, remember, for him, he believes he's doing all of this for God. He believes he's hunting down arresting Christians for God. And so when God shows up and says, hey, you're persecuting me. He's like, who, who, who are you, Lord? He's completely, absolutely theologically destroyed in this moment. He has no idea what's going on. He's completely confused. And the response is very interesting, okay? He says, I am Jesus. Now, for Saul, a, a good Jewish boy, he's going to hear that. He's going to hear, I am. Who are you? I am. Okay, well, he knew who the I am was. That was God. That was Yahweh. That's how we, that's, it was the name of his God is I am. And he hears, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. You see that? It's a very interesting response. And then he spends some time that he's just unable to see, and he chooses not to eat or drink. Now, at this point in the passage, we're not really sure why that is. If he's fasting, if he's praying. Later, we realize that he was praying because the passage says so. He says, well, there's a man named Saul who's praying. So he spends three days not eating, not seeing, not drinking, and he's praying. So Ananias shows up, and that, that's when we see this prayer revealed. Now, Ananias does a similar thing here. See, I'm really getting a double whammy tonight because we're not just seeing the call of Saul. We're seeing the call of Ananias. And so the Lord shows up, and he says, Ananias. See that call formula again? He just calls his name, Ananias. And this time, Ananias answers properly. He, he's got the correct response. He probably knows the scripture for when Samuel answered this question correctly. Here I am, Lord. Samuel had answered a bunch of times until he finally got the Lord part right. <laughs> right? So, so here we are, and he says, here I am, Lord. And he goes, there's a man named Saul. I'm sending you to him. I need you to take care of him. And he's like, I've heard of this guy. Hold on about this. Right? But immediately he says, here I am, Lord. And he tells him about a man who is currently praying. I want you to go to him. He's currently praying. So Saul, and I really want you to understand this. Saul's life is completely turned upside down. You have to be careful. Jesus will do that to you from time to time. Turn your life upside down. Turn your whole world, everything you, you think you know, upside down. And he does exactly this to Saul. And Saul's most appropriate response is, is to just begin praying. I mean, he's seriously praying. He's fasting. He's like, I don't want anything to distract me. I am completely messed up. I need to just sit here, unable to see, and pray. And so he does. And that's the first thing I want you to understand. Through all of these callings, we have to understand that we are called to pray, okay? Especially when we're dealing with God's call in our life. We're trying to understand that. We're called to pray. Calling should always breed prayer. Don't ever come to me and be like, God's called me to do this. Because I'm going to ask you, did you pray about it? And if you say no, how am I supposed to trust God's calling you to do anything? You have to approach this in prayer. Always, 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 always approach calling in prayer. You have to pray about it. And that's what Saul does. He spends just some time praying. He just needs to pray about it. Now, Ananias, he, he knew who Saul was. He had heard it. Like I said, Saul had a reputation. It's not what you'd call a good reputation. He was known for, for killing people. And, and yet, we, we see Ananias here who, I mean, he asked some questions, but he's like, uh, isn't that guy who's like literally walking around with a paper that says he can arrest me? Should I? You know, I would be hesitant. And yet, he goes. He, he asks him about it. He says, no, I'm, I'm, he's my chosen instrument. I've got a special purpose for him. So go. And he goes. He goes and he, he, he's obedient. But you have to understand, Ananias, there's a big hindrance here. There's a big, big hurdle. He's got to learn how to somehow get past all of this 
wrongdoing. He's, he's got to learn to forgive him a little bit in order to be able to actually go preach the gospel to him, in order to go minister to him. He's got to get over this fact that he's done these horrible things to his fellow brothers and sisters. Oftentimes, we're going to have to do that. If we're, if we're going to faithfully be Christians, we, we're called to forgive. That's another one of those that we haven't hit yet in this whole series of called out, but it's true. We're called to pray, and we are called to forgive. When you're dealing with calling and you're trying to understand what God's calling you to do, if you can't do those two things, it's going to really mess you up. It's going to really stop you from being able to be very effective at all. We're called to forgive. So anyone, I don't want names here, okay? But raise your hand if you, if you know someone who like maybe goes to your school, but they've got kind of a reputation, right? You're like, oh, yeah, they're kind of the, the you know. Th- there's always those people, right? We, we always know that that table over there is, is like the band nerds, okay? They're known. Their reputation is for being in love with band, okay? And these people over here, those are those cross-country runners. They're the ones that, that we, we know they're crazy. They run all the time, okay? And the football players sit over there, and the cheerleaders hang out together over there, right? We see those cliques that develop. Well, oftentimes, people have those kinds of reputation. Jonathan probably has this reputation around his school that he's a cross-country runner. Don't you think, Jonathan? Probably so, yeah. It, so you have these reputations. Sometimes you'll have that reputation as the, the local Christian, the local like Bible expert. Any of you, any of you found that in your, in your schools? That was, that was a real thing at my school. We only had a handful of us, so I was like one of the five. I was like, yeah, you, you got to go ask one of those guys. They'll, they'll know. Well, I can assure you, I... I don't have all the answers in Scripture now. I certainly did not have them all in high school, okay? But that was the reputation. I realize now it was really a reputation to be quite happy about, but at the time, it's kind of stressful, okay? It was stressful, Sharon. I'm serious. It was stressful. (laughs) It's still stressful, isn't it? But we develop these reputations, and Saul had a very bad reputation. He had this reputation for, for arresting and hurting people. Can you imagine for a moment... Someone in your school having a reputation, maybe some of you don't have to imagine that hard, someone, a reputation for rebuking Christians, for arguing with you, right? You're going to go try to tell them about the gospel, and they're going to have an argument ready for you. They're going to have a good reason why not to believe in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine God saying, I need you to go tell that person about me? Because, spoiler alert, he does. He's called you to do just that. And that can be hard. You have to, in some way, learn to be able to forgive that person. You have to be able to learn to let go of your pride. Because your pride is going to want to say, no, you can, you can rot in H-E double hockey. You know? and, and, and that's not the right attitude at all. Sometimes that's the one we're tempted to have. But Ananias chose to be obedient. He chose to let go of all that. All right, I'm going to go to Saul. And he, he just goes so simply, right? He, he walks up to Saul, he just lays his hands on him, and he just, just very pastoral, right? Brother Saul, I'm here because I was sent. You know, and so he, he just comes, and, and, he, and he helps complete that process for him. It wasn't until another Christian came along and, and helped him, was there to minister to him, that, that he was able to complete that process. He was able to accept Christ as his Lord, and he got up and he was baptized, and he was healed. He began to see I want you to know something. If we've, as we've been praying for the lost for months and months and months, and you guys yourselves have a big paper upstairs full of names on it that are lost friends of yours, people you're praying for that you hope accept Christ, oftentimes when, you're, when you pray for them, I've noticed this, sometimes when we're praying for them, we're really praying for God to flip their world upside down, for things to almost to go badly in their life so that they realize, they understand that, oh, I need Jesus. Because we're aware of that need, but sometimes the comforts of our lives Pre- prevent us from seeing that. Oftentimes, we see these great big conversion stories only in complete tragedy, complete and utter destruction of our lives. Or when our worlds are turned upside down, all of a sudden we're willing and ready to believe. And oftentimes, when you pray for someone, that may be exactly what God does. I wonder how many Christians back then were praying for Saul. I just wonder if there were any or if there were several praying for Saul, and finally Saul's life is tossed upside down. And then we're called to go and help write that, help tell him, I know right now everything's confusing, and right now you're feeling chaotic and confused, and and you're blind in many ways. But I'm here to tell you about the way, the truth, the life. I'm here to tell you about Jesus so that you can see. That's exactly what Ananias does, and then he's able to see 
Ananias does the very thing we're all called to do, the thing that Jesus told us to go and do. It's our big overarching theme tonight. If you remember nothing else, remember this, Christians, we are called to evangelize. It's part of the gig. It's part of who we are. We're not ever told to be Christian and then just go sit on our butts for the rest of our life. We're called with a purpose. And one of those purposes, one of those callings on every Christian's life is to evangelize. That's a word that literally just means share good news. And he's talking about the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came and died for our sins and then was resurrected so that we could be free from sin. So that when we die, we can spend eternity with Christ. That's the gospel. That's the very simple, beautiful message that we're called to tell people. And yet we struggle so much with it. And sometimes it's because we're unwilling to pray. I tell you right now, you want someone to, to come to know Jesus. Okay, I want you to think of that person's name. Go ahead. Think of a name right now. Think of that person's name. If you want them to, to come to know Jesus, I encourage you to pray for that person. Every single day, pray for that person. You'll notice that God's going to do some weird things to your heart where you're just desperate for it. Eventually, you're absolutely desperate for God to just save this person because you've been begging him day in and day out to just save that person. You also might notice that God's going to give you some opportunities or there's going to be some things in that person's life that you're going to have to overlook to be able to just forgive. Look, they hurt me. They've sinned against me. They have whatever reputation, but I want them to be saved, Lord. Sometimes we also think someone's just too unreachable. No, 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 no. They're just, they're, you know, there's just this, this famous person out there or, or they're just, you know, they're, I don't really hardly know them very well. I just know their reputation. It'd be really good if God saved them, but I don't really, I'm not invested in it. So, so they're just too unreachable. Pray for them. Pray for them and, and see what happens. See what opportunities begin to develop. And I want you to understand that evangelism creates more evangelism because it creates more Christians. And what are Christians called to do? Evangelize. evangelize. What happened to Saul? He was saved. He spent some time in Damascus and then began proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. He got right to work, didn't he? Right to work. This is the origin story of a Christian. And that was as simple as it was. He was a Christian, and so he was going to start preaching Jesus now. No more breathing threats and murder. I'm going to start preaching Jesus. And he goes all in. So who is this who is this Saul person? I want you to note this too cuz it's just a fun little Greek thing, okay? He He's on this road, okay? And he's after followers of the way. And in the Greek, those words are one and the same. Way, road, path, all the same thing, okay? So he's on the way to be on the way to kill people who are followers of the way. And then on the way, he falls to the ground before the way and then confesses the way as Savior. Isn't that interesting? Wordplay in the Bible. It happens all the time. It's amazing. And, and this is what... Is that an amen back there, Jess? <laughs> I, I could hear it. <laughs> it happens all the time. And so we see Jesus do this miraculous, wonderful thing in this man's life because someone else was faithful to go evangelize. Oftentimes we all want to be the Apostle Paul. We all want to be the Billy Grahams, but we never really will be unless we can first be the Ananias. The man who's simply willing to overlook things and to go and evangelize, to go tell somebody about Jesus. And so he does just that. And he goes, he could be arrested for it. He doesn't know that Saul's actually, because it, you notice that he doesn't actually say, the angel doesn't tell him, it's going to be totally safe, by the way. I, I've taken care of him already. <laughs> he could be converted later. This could just be one step, right? Planting the seed. I'd hate to be the seed planter in this situation, right? And so, so he's not, though. He just trusts that everything's going to be okay. We are called to evangelize. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again believer, you're simply called to that. That's part of who you are, part of your identity now. It'd be uh, the equivalent of deciding, you know, I'm going to be a runner. I've decided I want to be a runner. Now, if I never go running and I never sign up for any races, do you think I'm a runner? But I've said I'm a runner. 
I've told you that I'm a runner. Yeah. Does it make it true if I just say it? No. You've got to do it, right, Jairus? If I'm a runner, I need to go run. If I'm a Christian, I need to be a dang Christian. I need to go evangelize and tell people about Jesus Christ because part of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ is telling other people about how they can believe in Jesus Christ. Amen, Cole? That's, right. <laughs> That's what it means. If you're wondering about your calling in your life, because I, I know what it was like to be a youth, the, the big question for me all the time, I always wondered, what's, what's God's purpose for me? What's his big plan? Well, it's a very simple plan. Go tell people about me, Nathan. So here we are. How can you go and tell people about Jesus? So I'm going to go ahead and invite the praise team back up. We're going to sing one more time. And I'm just going to ask you this question. Who are you tonight? When you read this passage, when you hear this passage, this message, who are you in this passage? Think about that. Are you Saul? who think you've got your life all figured out, you think you've got all the answers, you think you're ready to go, or at least pretty mostly got it ready to go. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what I need. Or is your life being turned upside down? Paul on his knees before this great shining light blinding him. It's time to repent of sin and surrender to the Lord, if that's you. If, if you don't actually have this personal relationship with Jesus because you haven't confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you've never really believed in Christ and his ability to save you from your sins and his desire to his love for you, and you simply haven't wanted to follow the Lord, tonight is the night to do that. I encourage you, when we're singing this last song, we'll have plenty of adult leaders back there who would love to share the gospel with you, who would love to tell you more about Jesus. We'd love to just be there as you pray to receive Jesus. So I encourage you to do that tonight if you haven't yet, even if everyone else in this room thinks you have. Are you Ananias? Has God been sending you to evangelize to someone? You pass them in the hall every day, and God says, I've asked you to talk to them. I've asked you to tell them about who I am. Why haven't you done it yet? I understand it can be nerve-wracking. I understand sometimes those people have reputations or we have a reputation. But it's plain and simple. God's called us to do it. So will we be obedient? Are you going to be obedient, students? And if you need prayer for that, if we just need to pray with you to give you strength and courage, we'll do that. We'll gladly do that. Not an adult leader in here wouldn't be willing to pray with you for that. But it's time to be obedient to God's call. So tonight, whatever God may be calling you to, I encourage you to just surrender to it. Why don't you stand with me? Let me pray for us. And we'll sing this last song. Father God, thank you for these students. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Saul. And thank you for Ananias. Lord, I pray that we'd be willing to be obedient, you, with, obedient to you, Lord. I pray that we'd be willing to pray, willing to forgive. God, most of all, I really wish that we'd be ready and willing to evangelize, God, that you'd remove any barriers from our lives, Lord, any barriers from these students' lives. Lord, as they've been praying for lost people, I pray that you would give them those opportunities to talk to them. That you'd give them those opportunities, Lord, to tell somebody about who you are. And God, I pray that you'd save people from it. That you'd create revival starting right here in this group of students, Lord that it would affect every school system out there. Lord, please begin to save students' lives. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, I pray.